In my last lecture, I confused you by skipping around between mosques. Today, I'm going to try to stick with a somewhat more coherent chronology and geography, and instead, I'll confuse you by mixing up different kinds of works. Islamic art includes many universal elements, but it has also changed over time and developed important regional variations, often reflecting early art traditions from those same geographical regions. First, let's dash through a little more history. In my first lecture about Islamic art, I talked about the life of Muhammad, his immediate successors, the four caliphs, and the establishment of an Umayyad caliphate headquartered in Damascus. An Umayyad caliph ordered the construction of the Dome of the Rock, completed in 691. The Umayyads, however, lost out to the Abbasids in 750 CE. A branch of the family then fled to North Africa and on to Spain, where it established its capital at Cordoba. Here's a map of the Umayyad Empire at its height before its downfall in 750. And here is a map of the Abbasid Caliphate that succeeded the Umayyads. Note again that an Umayyad dynasty lived on in Spain. We're going to return to El Andalus, or Muslim Spain, in a moment. But first, let's pause and talk about Islam as a religion of the book. For this, we will look at an Abbasid work from North Africa or the Near East. You completed homework for this work a couple of lessons ago. Sorry about any confusion that causes. I did want to spread the homework out more evenly. Anyway, this required work was produced on parchment, that is, on untanned animal skin. The Quran was one of Islam's greatest unifying forces, virtually always printed in Arabic. It created a common language and literature across the Islamic world. The reverence for the word likewise elevated the art of calligraphy, the beautiful hand. Calligraphers underwent years of training and the best became famous. Most early Islamic texts were written in the Kufic script shown here. Its bold, angular, even lines were easy to read even at a distance. Arabic, like Hebrew, is read from right to left, and its written form does not contain vowels, only consonants. The red symbols you see here, circled in purple, add in the vowels to make reading aloud easier. The five gold balls, circled here in green, mark the end of a verse of the surah or chapter of the Quran. The surah's title is written in gold ink and surrounded by a rectangle decorated with entwined vines. Do you remember the word for that? It's an arabesque. Note that the words are beautifully spaced on the page. Your reading assignment explained how calligraphers used interlines to space the letters properly. And now we move on to Al Andalus or Muslim Spain. If I were offered a trip in a time machine and told that I had to go back to the year 1000 CE, but I could go anywhere in that year, I'm pretty sure I'd dial up Cordoba. It was a city of vast learning, exquisite architecture and art, and a cosmopolitan, tolerant environment where Muslims, Jews, and Christians lived in relative harmony and with considerable intellectual and cultural exchange. We've already examined the Mosque of Cordoba. Now let's watch a video clip that talks about the Islamic culture of Muslim Spain and then takes you on a virtual tour of the Alhambra, to my mind the most beautiful building that I've ever visited, even more beautiful than a close competitor which we'll get to soon, the Taj Mahal. All three of these are required college board images. The Alhambra was both a collection of palaces and a military barracks and fortress. Although a fortress was first constructed on this site in the 9th century, the Alhambra was rebuilt in the mid-13th century by the Nasrid emirs of Granada, who succeeded the Umayyads. By then, the Christians had reconquered most of Spain, including Cordoba, and the Emirate of Granada was the last Muslim outpost in Spain. As you can see from the plan, the palace buildings are generally quadrangular, with all the rooms opening onto a central court. Succeeding rulers added new quadrangles designed on the same principle and connected with each other by smaller rooms and passages. The unifying theme was paradise on earth with columned arcades, fountains with running water, and reflecting pools creating an oasis effect of tranquility. The exterior was left plain and austere, disguising the beauty that lay within. We will see a somewhat similar layout when we get to the Taj Mahal, which was also a vision of paradise. Moorish poets describe the Alhambra as a pearl set in emerald. Makes sense to me. The Alhambra represents one of the peaks of Islamic decorative arts. Elaborate filigrees were carved into marble and even more into stucco. Here are the famous stalactite dome. 
These hanging decorative features, mukarnas, were created out of plaster, not stone. In other words, they were carved stucco. These tiles from the Alhambra reveal what two characteristic elements of Islamic art. Well, we see the use of calligraphy as a decorative element, and we see tessellations, or repeated geometric patterns. Before I reluctantly leave Al-Andalus, let me talk about the last of our required works from that region. A pyxis is a cylindrical container that held aromatic spices, cosmetics, or even jewelry. This pyxis was the gift to a son of the caliph, perhaps in honor of his 18th birthday. It was carved from ivory from an elephant's tusk, a beautiful, durable, but easily carved material that was very popular in both Islamic and Byzantine culture. On the right, you see the largest surviving Byzantine ivory panel, which is from the 6th century. Note the calligraphy just before the lid, below, excuse me, just below the lid. It reads, Blessing from God, goodwill, happiness, and prosperity to Al Mugira, son of the commander of the faithful, may God's mercy be upon you. So, what are we seeing in this central medallion, and what might it mean? We see a lute player flanked by two figures, one of whom holds the braided scepter and flask of the Umayyads, while the other holds a fan. The Khan Academy essay explained that the man with the fan might represent the Abbasids, who ruled off in faraway Baghdad, and had, of course, defeated the Umayyads of Damascus. So this work may be sending the message that the Umayyads, and not the Abbasids, are the legitimate rulers of, of Islam. So here are two more panels from the Pyxis. What's the likely significance of a lion attacking two bulls? Well, we've heard before that lions tend to represent kingly power, and this may just be glorifying the king, but it may also be another reference to Umayyads fighting Abbasids, conveniently ignoring that it was the Abbasids who won in most places. The men on horseback picking dates may also, according to art historians, refer to the lands lost of the Umayyads in the east. And finally, here we see two men collecting eggs from the nests of falcons, a symbol of Umayyad legitimacy. So, why all these human and animal figures in an Islamic work? Even though the inscription mentions Allah, this is not a religious work, so the prohibition doesn't apply. And what do you think might interest the college board about this work? Well, there's the theme of power and authority, go Umayyads. There's the reminder that the rule about aniconic images does not apply to secular or non-religious works. There's the influence of Byzantine art on Islamic art. And maybe the College Board just liked this work. I do. So I debated where to put the Golden Haggadah, into which unit that is, and chose to talk about this Jewish manuscript in the unit on Islamic art. This is a debatable choice, since in Unit 6 we will be comparing these pages with Gothic illuminated manuscripts that closely resemble the Haggadah. In fact, here's a little foretaste. The required French Gothic illuminated manuscript in the upper left shows a king and queen of France. The illustration from the Golden Haggadah on the bottom shows Moses and Aaron coming before the Pharaoh, who looks a lot like a French king. Some art historians think that the wealthy Jewish family that commissioned the Haggadah may even have hired Christian Gothic artists to produce it. But I decided to talk about the work here because Islamic medieval Spain was a golden age for Jewish learning and culture. Many Muslim rulers employed Jews as administrators, physicians, and scholars. Although Muslims conquered Barcelona in 720, their rule lasted less than a century. Charlemagne's son reconquered it for the Christians in 801. In the succeeding years, Jews made up as much as 15% of the population of Barcelona, and many became wealthy. They also made up a disproportionate percentage of the learned. In 1492, after their final victory over the Emir of Granada, Spanish King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella celebrated the unification of Christian Spain by sending Columbus west and expelling the Jews. So this work was made just decades before disaster struck this community. A Haggadah is a kind of storybook used during Passover. So why would it contain human images, something that's as strongly prohibited in Judaism as it is in Islam? Well, as the assigned essay explained, there was a Haggadah loophole. The Haggadah was considered educational rather than religious. Hmm. Anyway, here you see the plagues descending on Egypt when the Pharaoh refuses to let the Jews leave. The blown up panel on the right shows a plague of lice. The other panels show the plague of frogs, disease, and wild animals. Unfortunately, Ferdinand and Isabella did not get the message, don't mess with the Jews. And here we see the Jews escaping from Egypt. Standing on the, starting on the upper left, the Pharaoh orders the Jews to leave Egypt. 
The firstborn sons start to die after the Pharaoh changes his mind. The Israelites cross the separated Red Sea. And finally, this is the panel I enlarged since I liked it best, the Red Sea returns and drowns the pursuing Egyptians. On this page, we see the household preparing for the Passover dinner, or Seder. Clockwise from the upper right, Miriam, Moses' sister, joins maidens in dancing and playing instruments. The family cleans the house for Passover. The master of the house, sitting under a canopy, orders the distribution of matzah, or unleavened bread, and haroset, a sweet made from nuts and fruit, excuse me, I think it's haroset, to the children, and sheep are slaughtered for Passover while a man purifies utensils in a cauldron over a fire. In the panel I enlarge, which shows the home being prepared for Passover, the man holding a candle is searching for unleavened bread, and the woman and the girl are cleaning their home. In Jewish tradition, all traces of leavened bread, even the smallest crumb, must be removed from the home before sunset on the first day of Passover. Before we move east again to look at the Islamic art of the Mamluks, Ottomans, Persians, and Mughals, let's drop south for a moment and revisit Jenne. This map shows the spread of Islam into Africa starting about 750 CE. Historians aren't entirely sure when the first mosque on this site was built, as early as 1200, as late as 1330. The earliest written record we have for the mosque states that a Sultan Kumburu became a Muslim and had his palace pulled down and the site turned into a mosque. The original mosque presided over one of the most important Islamic learning centers in Africa during the Middle Ages, where thousands of students came to study the Quran in Jenne's madrasas or schools. Eventually, the site was abandoned and fell into decay. At the bottom, you see a French journalist drawing of the mosque in 1895. In 1906, the French administration in the town arranged for the original mosque to be rebuilt, and since then it has been substantially remodeled. The three towers in the Qibla wall were added at this time. Our historians still debate how much the design reflects the taste of the French administrators as opposed to the beliefs and preference of the Muslim leaders of Jenne. So let's return to our Islamic art and architecture video for an excellent visual introduction to this mosque. You'll note that our commentator weighs in pretty strongly in the debate about just how African the design really is. As you saw, the walls of the Great Mosque are made of sun-baked earth bricks and sand and earth-based mortar and are coated with a plaster which gives the building its smooth, sculpted look. The mosque is built on a platform that is raised almost 10 feet above the level of the surrounding marketplace, shown here. These are two College Board required images. The platform prevents damage to the mosque when the Brani River floods. The cone-shaped spires or pinnacles at the top of each minaret are topped with ostrich eggs, which are a traditional pre-Islamic symbol of purity and fertility. They also protect the top of the mosque or the towers from disintegration. The walls of the building are decorated with bundles of palm sticks, called turon, that project from the surface. These also serve as a scaffolding for replastering the mosque, and they are also part of the pre-Islamic tradition of the region. So let's play our guessing a game again. What point is the College Board making with the second required image on the lower right? Well, I'd say it's that Islam is very much a communal religion. The mosque is the center of community interaction. It houses a school, and a market has grown up around it. This is an image that I think the College Board should have inc included, because this is what I find most fascinating about this mosque. Jenny is located on a river plain, and while the weather is generally dry, it experiences monsoon rain. So every spring, it needs to be replastered. The entire community of Jenny comes together at this fa annual festival of the Crepissage. Music, dance, and some serious eating are apparently involved. So now we begin moving back east, toward where our story of Islam began. The invasion of European crusaders, not a high point in the history of Christendom, increased the fragmentation of Islamic civilization, as would invasion by Mongols from the east. One consequence, to oversimplify some very complicated history, was the rise of the Mamluk Empire. The Mamluks were a group of warrior slaves, mostly Turks, who took control of several Muslim states and established a dynasty that ruled Egypt and Syria from 1250 until the Ottoman conquest in 1517. The Mamluks were not only first-rate warriors, they were also first-rate craftsmen, renowned across the medieval world for their glass, textiles, and metalwork. Master metal craftsman Muhammad ibn al-Zayn created this brass basin in the early 14th century. The story it tells is all about the power, wealth, and authority of Mamluk rulers. 
the basin's wide central outer band depicts processions of Mamluk emirs, or officials. Four horsemen in roundels punctuate the procession of dignitaries and give the work rhythm and unity. They may be the personification of different aspects of furusiya, or the Muslim art of horsemanship. Friezes of animals and coats of arms frame the exterior band and decorate the basin's interior as well. The basin is an example of an object that is produced for one ceremonial context, but later appropriated for another. And that's my guess about why the College Board made this uh, one of its required works. Change over time. The basin was probably commissioned by a wealthy Mamluk patron to serve as a banqueting piece or alternate, alternatively as a vessel for ceremonial hand washing. Eventually, however, it ended up in France, where the basin was used at least from the 17th century to baptize children born to the French royal family, including Louis XIII. The various coats of arms on the basin may have been worked over later with a fleur-de-lis. On the other hand, it's a motif that appealed both to the basin's original Islamic and later European owners. The flower was a popular Mamluk emblem in the 13th and 14th centuries. <coughs> Excuse me, it was also a heraldic device of the French royal family. Here are just a few images from the basin, including the artist's signature, which appears six times. He was proud of his work. Like our Khan Academy scholars, I especially like the fellow walking a leopard. I'm going to finish up today with the Muslim empire that ended the Christian, Christian Byzantine Empire, turning its capital of Constantinople into Muslim Istanbul. Let's watch a brief video introduction to this fascinating empire, which ruled much of Eastern Europe and the Middle East into the 20th century. And then I'm going to return to one Ottoman work we will study, or rather revisit, the Mosque of Selim II at Edirne. So I'm actually skipping over an exciting part of the story, the conquest of Constantinople by the Ottomans in 1453, the first major use of gunpowder in warfare. Instead, I'm moving right into the time of Suleiman the Magnificent, who ruled from 1520 to 1566. Suleiman was one of the most accomplished and fascinating rulers in world history, and I'm pretty much going to ignore him and focus instead on his chief architect, Sinan. The next video clip does not show our required work, the Great Mosque of Edirne, but rather the main mosque that Sinan built for Suleiman in Istanbul, shown here on the left, next to our required Mosque of Edirne. You'll see there are a lot of similarities. Yes, this is an artist who might invite an attribution question. Sinan lived to be 98, and he built over 90 large mosques, 50 smaller mosques, 57 colleges, 8 bridges, and numerous other public buildings throughout the Ottoman Empire. Lots of buildings for the College Board to choose from. Selim II was Suleiman's son, and he wasn't much of a ruler. He's mostly known for having spectacularly extravagant orgies. But he did have the good sense to employ Daddy's architect. Sinan himself considered this mosque to be his masterpiece, and that's saying a lot. So what identifies this mosque as the work of Sinan and as an Ottoman mosque, a style, by the way, that would be admired and copied throughout the Islamic world? Well, some of the elements I would list would be those tall, pencil-thin minarets, a wide open space where the mirab can be seen from every corner of the mosque, and above all, that soaring dome surrounded by smaller half domes or apses or excedrae. So here's a plan of the mosque. This is the College Board required image, but with labels. Sorry, it's a little blurry. I couldn't find a clearer image. Note that the worship hall is surrounded by outbuildings, a madrasa or school, a cemetery, a dormitory for students, and a covered colonnaded market. The complex also included a hospital and a soup kitchen. The mosque itself is an octagonal uh, rectangle with a dome contained within a rectangle that has four ewans or rectangular recessed openings, a lot of rectangles there, into the corridor. We saw rounded ewans at Isfahan and we'll see them again in my final lectures. Note also the large courtyard with the fountain for ritual washing. This is an entire religious community, the center of communal life as well as religious ritual in the city. Here's a more panoramic view of the huge prayer hall, which shows the half domes surrounding the central dome. The areas beneath the half domes are called excedrae, semicircular recesses. And here's the dome itself. Note the striped voussoirs and the tessellated designs in the mosaics. What else echoes the mosque at Cordoba? Well, again, we see double arches. I'm going to close with the building that dates from a millennium earlier, and the building that we will study in depth in Unit 6. When the Ottomans conquered Constantinople, they turned the world's largest building into a mosque. 
That's when the minarets were built. In looking at Sinan's work, it's very important to understand that much of what inspired and motivated Sinan was a desire to imitate, to equal, and finally to surpass the accomplishments of the Byzantine architects. Again, stay tuned. In my final Islamic art lectures, I will move further east and look at art that combines Islamic elements with artistic traditions borrowed from other cultures, Persia 